Peter Merry, welcome to the series Exploring the Future of Western Civilization. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, for those that don't know Peter, um, I found it quite hard wondering how to introduce him because um, the conventional phrases would not really capture who he is. So for me, I describe him as someone who genuinely is an evolutionary leader at the evolutionary edge of our culture. He's someone who has done an awful lot of work um, facilitating change in organisations, both um, traditional ones, corporate ones, and um, new emerging uh, transitional organisations. Um, he's founder and chair of the Centre for Human Emergence in the Netherlands, which is um, part of a global network of integral and spiral dynamic um, uh, facilitators, thinkers and actors, meshwork. Um, he's director of the Wisdom University in Europe. Um, he's founder and director of the Hague Center for Global Governance, Innovation and Emergence. He's partner at Engage, which is all about earning a living by doing what we're passionate about. Here in the UK, I, I should say actually he's in the Netherlands, uh, but where I am in the UK, he's fellow of the Center for Human Ecology. And um, he's currently finishing off his PhD at Wisdom University uh, in his final year um, of vocational training in ecotherapy, which I think you call something else in English. What do you call yeah, it? Yeah, I refer to it as systemic energy tuning. Yeah. And um, he's written, I think you've written one book and there are two in the pipeline. The, he's written a great book, which I really recommend, called Evolutionary Leadership. And there are two on their way, The Pain and the Promise and Leading from the Field. So, um, Peter, does that, does that capture the story? Yeah. <laughs> Reasonably. Yeah, those are all forms and... Yeah, that's right. He's also yeah. a farmer. And, you know, I'm kind of live in this ecological neighbourhood of a town in the Netherlands, and I'm a father of three little boys. So that's all a big part of the story. I sing in a folk band, and uh, so that all belongs. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, if I could kick off with the the big picture question, what what is the state of Western civilization? <laughs> What's the state of it? Well, I think it, we, could, we could say without a doubt that it's in transition, um, but I think it's in um, a certain kind of transition which is non-linear in its nature. So I think what we're seeing is the, the form and the belief systems and the paradigm which shaped Western civilization falling apart in many different ways, people finding that the, the way of thinking about the world is proving inadequate to the reality they're experiencing leaders in organizations finding that the, the way they've organized themselves, the way they've been trained to lead is proving inadequate to the complexity and intensity of change. And we're in just one of those, what Evan Laszlo would call chaos points, really where the old system is falling apart and the new one hasn't crystallized enough yet for it to be able to take over the hell. So it's, we're kind of, haven't really got a handle on things uh, at the moment. So I'd say we're in that, in that phase right now as well. Mm. How do you know, I mean, people have always said, there have always been doom mongers and people who've said everything's coming to an end. How, how do you know things really are that challenging rather than just we're experiencing life as normal? Well, I mean, I think you just look around at the multitude of issues that are coming to a head. Um, apart from anything else, the way the climate is just this year. I mean, I think it's not something that's coming. I think it's here. Uh, and just the... Uh, all, the re all the weather records that have been broken this year, um, just take the last few weeks and the massive drought that's been in the, in the US, and then people are linking that and saying, look how that's going to affect world food prices. Now look how the world food prices is going to affect social instability. Look how so social instability is going to provide feeding ground for extremism. Look how that's going to feed into global pandemics. Now, and the whole thing is interlocked. Yeah. So it's a single issue, it's multiple issues that are converging. Um, and feeding into each other. Um, and I think even if we take the, the climate issue, um, you're seeing all these feedback loops reinforcing each other. So as in Siberia, the permafrost starts to melt, then the methane is released, which increases the, the, the instability of the climate, which is going to increase permafrost. So, so the whole thing is, is reinforcing itself. And uh, that's why I think it's um, 
it's a it's an intensity of change which we've not seen for a while. Probably epochal, in mm. a sense, uh, really a new a new era coming. When you say we're well going into a new era or a, a transition, do you is it do you think it's predetermined? Is it clear what's going to happen, or is it all up in the air and with many possible <laughs> futures? It's both in a way. It seems to me like there is a there's a general pattern unfolding uh, of, of the, the kind, some of the qualities that, um, if it is to take form, this new civilization will have. So that's beginning to shape up. And at the same time, what that's going to look like in terms of how we organize ourselves in our societies, in a governance level, in our organizations, our communities. Um, how that, what that's going to look like in terms of our own behavior, all of that's still up in the air. And the question of exactly how much of humanity is going to be there at the end of the transition to give form to that civilization is also up in the air. Um, so I don't think, I don't believe anyway that it's up in the air as to whether humanity as a species or Homo sapiens sapiens as a species will make it through. I think we're going to make it through. Um, quite how many make it through is up in the air, but I mm. think we're going to make it through. And do, do you have your own particular vision? Do you, do you see a, a, an exciting, positive way forward? I see an exciting, well, I see a, I see a positive outcome. Uh, the way forward is certainly going to be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think what happens in these moments is two things happen at the same time. There's increasing breakdown and stress and pain and suffering, and there's, in, and there's increasing breakthrough, mm. innovation, uh, discovery, and all the ener positive energy that comes with that. And yes. I think they're going to intensify exponentially at the same time uh, as we move forward. And what's important is why, what you put your attention on. Now, if we put, if you try, if we hold on to the old and put our attention on what's falling, then it'll pull us with it. Mm. Put our attention on what's emerging, then that's what we align with, and that's what will start to manifest and attract to us in our own lives as well. I do think there's a role to play in the old, but that's really a hospicing role. It's how do we help the old system to die gracefully so that it can fertilize the soil for the new, rather than toxify it in a kind of painful struggle of really trying to hold on when actually it's wanting to let go. In fact, the other day I got an insight uh, coming, kind of coming out of a deep kind of meditation practice that actually the old system is at one level already dead. And uh, what's happening is that we're keeping it in the twilight zone um, by trying to hold on to it. And actually what it's wanting to do is to be given a ritual burial and honored for the contribution it's made, but then kind of ritually closed so that it can kind of pass, as it were, into the into history, into the other domains, and yet we're, it's haunting us like a ghost at the moment because we're mm. still kind of giving it lots of attention. And then particularly when we start to fight against it, we actually turn it into zombies, mm. you know, that actually suck and draw energy. <laughs> it was like, oh, well, maybe it's already dead, and it's dead but not buried. Yes. Well, it needs to be dead and buried. Yeah. Little, ritual and, and honor. Yeah. That's interesting. That reminds me of a conversation I had with um, uh, Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, who um, who said that we were living on path through a Christian lens. We you know we're living on past spiritual capital, and it's kind of there, but it's in decay. Mm. But what what is emerging then? What what should we be putting our attention on? I think there's there's two kind of I think two different perspectives to look at it from. One is the one which is more common currency, which is making sure that in the way we evaluate uh, our activities that we include impact on planet, impact on people, the kind of more classic sustainability story, which is basically a kind of upgrade of the current paradigm, which says, well, if we're going to uh, use money as an exchange system, use our current accounting as the model to work by, then let's make sure that we internalize uh, the true costs of what we're doing so that the price we pay for things uh, and the way we make decisions is an accurate reflection of the true value of stuff in the world. Now that, I think, may be more of a stepping stone 
um, than actually the place we're going. Because if we accept that what's going on is actually a non-linear phase in evolution, so all the kind of previous civilizational leaps uh, have been non-linear in the sense which means that you can't actually uh, see what that's going to look like from the old lens. Mm. So upgrade of the current system uh, is is not going to be an accurate picture of what it's actually going to look like. It's like somebody gave me the image a while ago of walking into a, a cave, you know, hundreds of years ago where a monk is transcribing uh, a Bible or something and trying to explain the internet. You know? Yeah that kind of a difference. Um, but whereas maybe two years ago I was saying we don't have any signs of what's emerging, we just have to focus on the process of enabling emergence, create the conditions, be in the not knowing, be innately curious, help old stuff fall away. I think we are beginning to see indications of some of the qualities of that, uh, of what's kind of beyond our current paradigm. And it's to be found in, uh, I think, where you see the new science and the ancient wisdom traditions beginning to meet um, in a sense of a, a reconnection uh, between uh, mind and matter. So there's going to be an increasing realization that actually uh, everything that we see and experience around us is composed of energy, which, you know, I mean, quantum physicists have been saying since 1970 in the spiritual traditions from how many thousands of years, but, you know, anything, even these physical things around us, if you look at them under a microscope, are all moving, they look solid to our perception, but they're all just energy. And so is a thought that we have energy, so is a, an emotion that we have, and, and as like the, uh, they showed at Princeton University, 28 years of research, the engineering department, that without a statistical doubt, human intention affects the otherwise random nature of events. So when a computer generates zeros and ones randomly, if you have somebody, even the other side of the world, try to get more zeros or more ones uh, off the computer, it has a statistically relevant impact. Mm. So it's all proven uh, without a doubt. I think that what's, uh, what we're now beginning to, it's like how does that perspective begin to trickle down into the collective consciousness because it doesn't fit our Newtonian paradigm, mm. fit the way we've been trained to think about the world. Yeah. So it's going to involve really, I think, a, an understanding, but also a felt sense of uh, the deep interconnectedness of everything, um, and 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 therefore, um, what I'm, you know, that's I've obviously been aware of that perspective for a long time. It's in all kind of spiritual traditions and everything mm -hmm. else, but what we're beginning to see is, um, so well, it's easy enough to say it's all one, I mean, okay, great, and, and now what, you know, and as we begin to look at, get an understanding of, say, some of the universal, universal geometric principles, for example, understand really the implications of some of Buckminster Fuller's work or uh, some of the stuff that Nassim Haramein is discovering at the moment about the science of vacuum, you know, we're beginning to start to be able to put language on the process that connects up a unified field with the material reality mm. that actually looks like, uh, what the design principles are of life at that level of the whole creation process, um, the torus being you know, one of the key forms that seems to be emerging ar around that, and the, what are the physics of the torus? You know? What's the torus? Torus is like a... Uh, uh, like a, if you look at a weather system that kind of swirls like this, like a vortex, um, but then it kind of comes in and out at both ends. It kind of does this really, cycles round and around like this in a kind of 3D uh, form. And um, NASA have some great images of galaxies that actually, you know, they look like this flat, but they have this bulb at the top and they have a bulb at the bottom. You know, and so the energy is doing this and it's manifesting out here. But there's a dynamic, in a way, you could say, between two poles, uh, one of which is a more energetic, let's say, subtle pole, and the other which is more gravitational. So the kind of combination of, of expansive light, in a way, and gravitational pull into matter, that somehow then is what creates the manifest reality at the center. So in a way, the, the, the kind, of, kind of combination of heaven and earth, or, or thought and intention and manifestation. Mm. Right. So there's, and, and 
what I think we're beginning to discover is that, or rediscover, or discover anew, or whatever, is that there's a, a whole world of um, life that exists beyond the physical world that we can see. And that whether whatever language we choose to use to describe it or give names to it or whatever, that that um, dimension of reality um, has a role to play in the manifestation of a coherent reality. And that once we start to realize that we don't have to work it all out ourselves, but there's actually there's a whole domain of beings or life forms or energies that exist outside of our normal perception, and that they have a role to play, then the whole thing becomes far less uh, effort. Mm. We start to co-create um, with other dimensions of life that we've either forgotten about or never never come across before. Uh, Peter, could I ask you to... Um, I, what I'd really love to do is, because you've been doing some fascinating work for many years in lots of contexts, I'd like to kind of run across a few practical contexts to see how you see things emerging. What about in in the family, the the relationship between the masculine and the feminine, um, between the adult and the child? What what? How does this all relate to that context? Kind of speculation, really. But if I uh, lean into that, um, I think one of the things that's happened as we kind of reached the end phase of our civilization is there's been a blurring of identities where the feminine has you know, felt it needs to adopt, uh, take on some of the masculine, and the masculine has felt it needed to take on some of the feminine. And I think that's been an important process of, being a of each of those two being able to become familiar with the other, being able to respect it and have a feel for it. My sense is what's going to come next is more of a turn of a natural order, but from an informed perspective, where the masculine does what the masculine naturally does, mm. and the feminine does what the feminine naturally does. Mm. And there's a kind of an understanding of, uh, of how co-creation works, where each of those energies uh, steps into its true uh, power, its true place in a system. Um, which doesn't mean all this form that we would associate with it traditionally, like the feminine means you will stay at home and with the kids or whatever, the masculine means you will go off and hunt and kill and bring back the money, you know, <laughs> not at all. But there is something about mm. sense of a return of natural order where we blurred those lines in our, in our um, efforts to kind of integrate everything and everything to be equal and the same. So that's, I kind of see that coming back. And also in parenting, actually, as well, I feel there's been... Almost the poor kids haven't been given the, the, the natural boundaries that they might need in their evolutionary process. You know, so if we understand the, uh, the, the natural evolution of an individual, we see there are moments where the thing children need most is boundary, uh, uh, rules, agreement, structure. And in our postmodern thinking, we often kind of felt, no, let's try to see them as an equal. Yes. Of equal value as a human being, but they're not the same in terms of where they are in their development. And when we try to treat them as equals and involve them as an equal decision-making player and stuff and don't take our responsibility as a parent to draw boundaries and take decisions, then they struggle because they're not given the pathway of natural development that we ourselves have been given to get where we are. So that's, and that's again about natural order. Yes. You know, there is a certain place we have and, a, and, a, and, a, um, and, and the children have need of that natural process yeah. to follow that natural flow so they can come into their own uh, space as well. So that's my, my sense is there's going to be much uh, a kind of a, almost a reintegration and a revaluing of um, the way things have been naturally but then now from a more conscious perspective. Right, because I'd like to, um, some people might listen to someone stuck at the postmodern or the uh, lower levels of development might listen to what you say and think, oh, he's just talking about conservative, back to basics. Men should be men, women should be women, discipline, structure, order, Christianity, God, queen, um, etc., etc. You're not really saying that. What's the difference between what you're saying and, and that? I'm saying that there's a place for that, but that it's temporary. It's like a, um, well, it's a phase of development. 
that's necessary to build certain cognitive emotional uh, capacities in a way that piece that you're that we're kind of pointing to there the need for order structure know your place natural hierarchy uh, enables you to stabilize uh, a sense of uh, belonging in the collective like that's why we have agreements you know that uh, societal agreements that we've made with each other uh, because if we didn't then uh, you'd become very uh, dog eat dog you know and people would uh, not everybody, but a lot of people would just take for their own end, which is why we have uh, agreements and agreements which are enforced. Uh, that creates a certain foundation upon which we can continue to grow. The, if it was purely only that, then that blocks further development and becomes suffocating. Uh, but as a, a channel to flow through on the way to your own finding your own individual uh, energy and role within that context it's it's critical uh, and it's the difference between just being an individual who is uh, doing their own thing oblivious to the needs of others to an individual who can find their own creativity and play the game creatively with others within agreed boundaries mm. so with this I'm interested in um, how can I say this um, I I worried for a long time about what I perceived as the collapse of authority. As I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, I observed wherever I looked, things were falling apart. So parents were, were not being respected, didn't have self-confidence. Teachers couldn't keep control in the classroom. All of our traditional icons were mocked. And, you know, th it really felt... Uh, Personally, I've, that, I've experienced that as insecurity, really, the de decay. And um, a few years ago, I went around and interviewed a lot of people um, from very broad backgrounds about authority. Basically, you know, what gives you the right to tell someone else to do something or to inspire someone else to do something, whether it's a, a teacher, a doctor, a parent, a military officer, and so on. And... Um, it's almost like I could, it, it was fascinating because almost, I almost sensed there was like a, a, a compass or a, a meme, bag of memes here. And there was a wobble in each one, even though they came from very different backgrounds. It was almost like they were speaking from the same hymn sheet, you know, this is right, this is wrong, this is the map, this is the truth and so on. And in our, it was like there's a warp in our system uh, around truth so this is true this is not true this is right this is not right and this is a healthy boundary and obviously that that's kind of the space you're in and i know what you've been doing with the wisdom university is looking at how to integrate you know how to basically go beyond a narrow idea of what science is and answer those questions how do how do we you know who are we what's right what's wrong what's true what's false and so on would you be able to, is it clear to you what's emerging? Is there something more, a more effective model of authority and truth coming through? Yeah, that's a good one. So what is true, what does truth, uh, right and wrong look like uh, from a more transpersonal perspective, uh, let's say? But it, that whole concept of natural order is an interesting one because it has a sense that um, there, there, is, uh, there are things which are more life-affirming than other things. There seem to be you know, beliefs or activities or behaviors that either contribute to the life process uh, um, or block it in some way. So in a way, the... the Discernment at that level is more around uh, whether a way of organizing something, a way of leading, a way of bringing up children or whatever, whether it's supporting the natural life process or whether it's inhibiting the natural life process. Um, and that's what, that's what we're looking for the whole time. So f to be able to discern in that domain, we need ourselves to have a sense of what is that natural life process. And that's, I think, what begins to kind of come online more as we, as we stretch up into those domains is a deeper feeling for uh, what, those, what that is, what those principles are, be it a kind of evolutionary 
uh, map of the landscape like spiral dynamics which takes us through different stages whereby you can see the children move through different phases of development and support them naturally in that process um, or be it uh, um, kind of what they might call sacred or natural geometric principles about like well how does nature design itself in such a way if you look at a tree or an ecology that parts are as coherent as possible with the whole. And can you take those principles and apply them to an organization, for example, or a community? How do you, if you take those, what the, you know, the way life seems to do it naturally, and then start to do it consciously in terms of our design of schooling, whatever, any, any domain, um, then it's what's like, what I think is likely to happen is that those environments that we create, or those habitats that we build are likely to be more life-affirming and vitalizing than the kind of box shapes or whatever it is you know, that, we, that we create at the moment. Mm. So, so right or wrong, true or false, to, in kind of my consciousness at the moment has a lot to do with what is life-affirming or what seems to be most resonant with the life process based on where a certain collective or individual is in that in that journey. I mean, you, you were telling me you live in a, a community. How, how does that play out there if you have a dispute or if, if you want to assert a particular position on something? Well, I mean, it's uh, not so much an intentional community as a neighbourhood. It's part of a town, neighbourhood of a town, so there's 200 households. And, you know, you have your own house and garden and there's a shared garden, big sand pit for the kids and stuff like that, and all the cars have to park on the perimeter. So you have, you have collective ownership of some of the land around your house, and for that you have to make collective decisions. And, there are, and there's a foundation that kind of um, is responsibility for representing the voice of the people who live in this neighborhood and who then interface with the city council, for example. Um, and really, I mean, I've only, well, I've been here a couple of years, and the decision-making process, uh, I'd say, is still in evolution. Um, and people are just trying to work, dis discover and work out different forms. I think it's been stuck uh, in the past in the kind of consensus decision-making processes where you know, it was all about having everybody's voices heard, but no real direction or uh, boundary setting or just kind of, taking a decision, you know, that was hard to do for people because of the consciousness. Um, but it feels like that's, that's, that's coming more into, into play at the moment, so that's interesting to be following, yeah. Mm. To, to take, well, it, it seems like a radical step, but I, it's, it's just another way of looking at the context. In where you are in Holland, you have a, um, th there's been a whole series of quite, um, or political murders, and um, I've forgotten his name. Who's the politician with the tall guy with the white hair? Wilders. Yes, Hirt Wilders. Um, you in Holland? You've got of in the cities uh, very large Muslim populations um, who've moved in in a relatively short space of time, and I'm interested to know how the kind of values that you talk about are going to be attractive to well-educated and liberal-minded, pluralistic, democratic-minded people who are aware of different perspectives and who are kind of sensitive and tolerant and open and multiculturally minded. Um, obviously, a lot of the center, cultural center of gravity of the Islamic population who've come into Holland is not all, of course, but more towards the absolutistic, authoritarian, patriarchal um, and tribal mentality. Now, when they, the, the challenge is that when those two cultures come together, what happens when you get conflict or disagreement or when one wishes to assert upon the other, what happens? And obviously the, the narrative that comes from um, Kiert Wilders and, and others is basically it's not going to work. We need to either ask those people to leave or train them to be Dutch or at the very least have very strict, powerful boundaries. Do you agree with that? Or um, I mean, because the thing is, I, I can envisage a really, really happy outcome in which Holland and other European countries are an incubator for 
and um, a kind of an evolution of Islam into the modern world. But equally, it could all go really badly and end up um, as an awful bloodbath and a civil war. What What's going to guide us towards a happy outcome? I think it's, it's been interesting to track it since I've been here. So I've been living here 12 or 13 years. And it was the beginning of the period I was here that you had a um, politician, Pinfortown, murdered, and then the, uh, the journalist, Herr Fachhoff, with a very explicit kind of fairly fundamentalist Islamic motive behind it. And the Netherlands, having been really kind of floating along in this nice, fairly protected postmodern mindset of including everybody and being a space for everybody was really shocked to the core by what happened because um, where all the talk had been of tolerance, they were then confronted with this question, well, should we tolerate intolerance? You know, and if we, if we allow intolerance to have a place, then, uh, then you know, how is that going to impact on our society? And are there certain rules or values which we should be protecting as a society, you know, and is that going to be exclusive? And that whole debate has really been raging uh, since those events happened. I think, um, I think the society has really evolved over those years, and what happened initially was that we got a quite a regression down to a, more, a sense of morality, all value, orders, order in the society, and got this uh, Christian Democrat Prime Minister, yeah, yeah, Peter Balkenender, who was really all about values, morals, and everything else. So the system naturally went back to recover some of the values that had been kind of um, relativized or swept away by the postmodern mindset, saying, oh, that's just one kind of thing, the other cultures have other values, and everything else, and realizing that, well, this nation also has an identity and a history um, that needs to be honored as well. So that having been recovered, um, then got uh, you know a more progressive uh, uh, kind of prime minister in, um, and things started to move on. And yet, still the big challenges for our leading politicians, um, who um, who most of all most of whom in, inhabit this postmodern mindset, is to be able to uh, engage authentically with the more authoritarian or power-driven value value systems that you see coming through, uh, not just, you know, the immigrant population, but also the kind of the, a lot of the Dutch population who just haven't been heard over the years. Hmm. Um, and so when somebody like Gerd Wilders shows up, what he's doing is giving voice to a significant section of the population um, who haven't been heard by a kind of postmodern elite, really, that's been off doing its own thing for a while, and where the frustration has, has built up. Uh, I think often, like Pim Fortown, his analysis and his naming of the issue is very valuable to the system. You know, put it made people actually have to confront mm. a part of society that they were just because they didn't have a, a way to deal with it, were just ignoring. Mm. And of course, his solution set is coming from a more ethnocentric perspective, mm. and the and the challenge for the the politicians now is to be able to. Uh, say to, to acknowledge the reality that is being reflected by what he has to say, but to come up with a more world-centric response that enables to, an integration of those values in a healthy way, rather than a kind of ex exclusionary way. And I, I, I have, I think, I think it's going in the right general direction. I mean, the other advantage we have, of course, is when you have political parties like those of Geert Wilders built on ethnocentric. Uh, and power-driven consciousness, they start to fall apart, which is exactly what's happening now. Everybody in, in fighting in his party, mm. parties disintegrating, and this is what happened with these efforts before, because they can't hold it together, because they're all basically in it for their own means, and there's big clashes, and so in the end, you know, they'll fall apart. They won't be able to maintain the coherence of any sustainable movement. Um, but what is important is that, the, is that the, the part of society that that is shining a light on is con continues to be seen by our world, the world-centric politicians, and that um, kind of more, more conscious uh, solutions are found, so that they can uh, people can have their place, and are not it's not assumed that they can immediately adopt a postmodern consciousness because that's that's not the way it is. And I think there's a lot of innovation going on in that area at the moment over here. So again, that's something the Netherlands might well have to offer the world is uh, is experience from a from a more conscious perspective of, of how to work with that rather than an us and them mentality. 
what what do you observe is happening within the Dutch Islamic population? What sort of uh, um, evolution culturally is going on? Well, I don't really have my finger on that pulse so much, so it's a bit speculative. But um, I mean, obviously, in any ethnic group, you have the different uh, different levels of conscious presence. So you have your progressive uh, Islamists, uh, you have the more fundamentalist and um, you're seeing, like, I know that some of the ways they've been uh, helping the communities to become more stable is using the fathers a lot more in re relationship to the son. It's that kind of more authoritarian order system. So if you want to get to the kids, you know, have the fathers out on the street, in a way, and making sure the order is kept. Uh, so there's been some of those that kind of a community in it, really, in that way. Uh, and, and looking for um, opportunities for them to integrate more into the economic life, because once you get once you get that, then, then then they get involved in the in the in the uh, entrepreneurship society, and and uh, and are moved away from a more kind of closed environment. That's a challenge, of course, with the current economic crisis and everything. Mm. It's in a way a potent mix if you've got people who are out of jobs. And frustrated and ethnocentric ways of thinking, then they're very quickly going to get polarization. Uh, so I don't know, we'll see how that plays out. But I think uh, the Dutch are doing as best, pretty good job of it uh, at the moment. Great. Thank you, Peter. I know you've been doing an awful lot of work on energetics and consciousness, looking at how the fields with both consciousness and energetic fields that we live in operate and um, um, I, I'm probably not educated enough to ask you the, the right questions but mm. I mean what what's the cutting edge of that how do we say at the very biggest level how do we create a field within which western and global civilization can be aligned and emerge with the best outcome well, uh, that's a bigger question that I can't really pretend to have an answer about. But um, well, I know what, you've been doing it on small scales. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I've yeah. what I've been what I've just really the reason I got to this is because we'd spent quite a while working on um, you know large scale projects in organisations of multi stakeholder event and multi stakeholder collaboration and using kind of the best of. Um, let's say integral approaches and uh, theory U and, and all of these things that basically work on getting a coherent social field or uh, field of relationships between people. And we're finding that that becomes incredibly complex when, for example, you've got 20 organizations you're trying to coordinate behind a superarching goal, overarching goal all who have their own thing and you're trying to kind of keep them connected to each other and it got, gets far too complex. In fact, the whole situation becomes very complex and I always have in the back of my mind that it's the solution we're looking for is something that's simple, you know, the kind of simplicity, the other side of the complexity. Um, and so we stopped when we were kind of in the middle of a number of these projects and well, there must be another way to do this. And that's when uh, we started to think more about the whole energetic piece and the way I frame it now is, I mean, the reason we we have a kind of a material architecture, a material dimension to our reality, and we were finding that when we get the relational architecture coherent between people, that enhances the material. So you know, results get achieved far better in organisations. Stuff gets done if the relationships are healthy in the system. That those two actually lie embedded in what one could call an energetic architecture. So that any system that has a name and a boundary basically also has an energetic feel to it. And we used to, you know, a lot of people are now used to the idea that a human has an energetic dimension to them and a Reiki is kind of taken off. You can get it on the street corner now mm -hmm. as well. The idea being if you need to heal yourself, then we send the body life energy mm -hmm. and that helps it to heal itself, basically. You know, the, the, the body is such a complex thing. I mean, a cell is far more complex than the rest of our being put together. Um, that how on earth are we supposed to know exactly what kind of intervention we should make in the body uh, when it's such a complex organism? 
which is, you know, the traditional medicine goes to the part and tries to fix the part, and then, of course, that triggers something else somewhere that wasn't predicted, which triggers something else, which triggers something else. So if we basically trust that the body can heal itself if the stressed and blocked energy uh, are removed from the system and it's got enough life force to it, that the organs know what they have to do, the cells know what they have to do if the en there's enough energy kind of flowing around, then we can take that same metaphor, as it were, and apply it to a social system. So let's say you've got a number of players, a number of organs or organizations in the system that have roles to play to serve people and the planet. Um, that if we can create, if we can create a coherent energetic field w around and between those systems, that they'll start to play the role they need to play. They'll start to self-organize because they know what they have to do fundamentally. But there's lots of stuff in the way. Mm. So um, I've been, I'm in the kind of the final year of this vocational training in ecotherapy, which is one approach that was originally developed in Germany with uh, something called resonance therapy, where they were working with forests at a distance that were suffering under uh, acid rain and ozone layer and stuff, and finding that if they, they could work the energetic field of a forest at a distance, um, that it would increase the vitality of the forest. And they had kind of biologists research it and, and with test trials and everything else, all the kind of blind systems and things. And all of that, now it was all proven again by the science that it seemed to have an effect. And then more recently, it's been applied to organizational systems or human systems more, uh, where they've also you know, researched 90 organizations and found that of 12 out of 14 criteria they set, there was statistically significant impact when these systems were worked with energetically. So, um, What does that mean? Through meditation or getting the people together to do something? No, it's, it's I mean, it's, uh, it is working at a distance with the system, so uh, as well as maintaining contact with the people who are responsible for the system as a whole and, and working with them to help, um, to help integrate the energetic information that's coming through. But it means, um, you know, you can, <clears throat> you can contact a forest by having a map of it, you know, shrunk down to a tiny size, but that is a fractal of the bigger system because it's just like, in a, in a holographic sense, a smaller version of that bigger reality. You can get in touch with it by just having the small map, as it were, in the same way that healers will get in touch with people at a distance through their name or through a photo or something. Mm -hmm we call a resonator with the system. And then uh, by dowsing, which is simply basically, you know, energetic information registers through our body. Um, so if you ask a question, which is, you know, muscle testing, you know, you kind of push down, like when you say your name and you're strong and you say that I'm called something else and you go weak, that's information that's in your, in your body about something that's true or not true or more vital as a, as a piece of information or less vital. And the same if you're working with a pendulum to dowse, that's just an extension of, your, of a movement of your body. So if we assume that energetic information we pick up in our body, um, then you can dowse information about that system once you're in touch with it. So if you're in touch with the forest or the organization, we have in this approach a set of agreed language which reflects how stressed energy in the system, blocked energy, how grounded it is, how much life force there is in the system, how much self-organizing self capacity of the system is, how much information it has integrated into it. So a number of parameters mm. which measure through dowsing. So you go, for example, okay, how ground, given the, the, what this system wants to achieve in the next year, how grounded is it? Zero, 10, 20, 30, let's say it comes to 30% or something. You have a set of target values for all these different energetic parameters which you're trying to reach um, because you know you've then got a coherent system. And then, and then you say to the system, in the same way you'd say to a patient in a doctor's surgery, or an intelligent doctor would anyway, you know, what do you need next? Mm. The system would say to me, well, I need grounding. Okay, I said, good, you need grounding. I've got this and this and this symbol or color in my, in my toolkit, which tends to help with grounding. You know, which one of these will be most effective for you when you test again? You know? Is that uh, all happening remotely, or do you do, you do that... Do, do you need to have the consent and participation of yeah. the people in the system? Got to have the consent and participation of what we call the steward or the guardian of that system. So that could be the head of a department, 
It's an organization that could be in terms of a forest, the ward of the forest, but the person or the team of people who are ultimately responsible for that entity, bound with that boundary and that name. Yeah. Do, does it matter if people believe it? Because a, a lot of people would listen to what you're saying and it would just sound mad or, you know, unrealistic. Do, do, does that matter? Can you do it with... Well, they've got to at least be open to the possibility. So, for example, last year I was balancing 3,600 hectares of land in the centre of the Netherlands and the warden of that land didn't really kind of necessarily believe the theory uh, or how it worked or anything, but he was open enough to be curious based on the fact that in the past uh, there are other uh, um, you know, parks and forests that have benefited from it. Hmm. Curious enough to say, yes, you know, I'm willing to, to give this a try. And then over the year you notice that they get increasingly uh, curious about it. And hmm. he doesn't really know the theory of how it works or, you know, what's going on. But he can feel more that there's something about it that works, you know, and he's been a great supporter you know, of the work. So they, don't, they have to at least be open for it. And the one thing they do have to do work with affirmations because you know, that's part of the role of the energetic steward or guardian is to um, be, be putting a, an image, as it were, into the field uh, of their desired uh, outcome. Mm. And what you start to do is then load. It's like, think about it as like you're beginning to um, create an increasingly uh, solid photocopy image of your potential future in the field and yes. the to say what you're doing is, is creating increasing wave coherence mm. so you're bringing probability waves into increasing coherence whereby you increase the probability that something's going to cohere enough for it to manifest in the 3d uh, reality yeah do have to be and if they don't do that um, then there's very little chance that they'll actually get the results they want yeah. you know we can get the energetic architecture coherent, but if the people in the organization don't do the things they need to do to manifest their goals, then it very quickly the energetic architecture will kind of collapse down as well. So it goes hand in hand. And one of, the, one of the key things I've discovered is you can't really talk about cause and effect at that level. I can't say because we're doing this energetically, it's causing that. Mm. Um, you, it, it, like, they kind of happen together. But what you can see from the research is that where there is energetic work done, then the results seem to be more positive than they would be otherwise. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a new domain, but I think it's going to grow mm. very quickly, primarily not just because it's kind of cool, but because it uh, it increases results. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm open to what you're talking about. I can appreciate that things can happen on that dimension and certainly you could translate it into more traditional language in terms of confidence, energy, uh, morale, cohesion and so on. Uh, I, I know you're operating on a higher level than that but it, it can translate it to something that I can understand. Um, but how, how can someone who is either as I am interested but haven't you know, I haven't experienced that. Is there a way to experience that, to te put it to the test, to um, so that one can apply one's own judgment to that? Because if it's true, it's amazing, and we all need to do it. Well, I mean, there's stuff you can look into. So you can explore the website at ecotherapy.org. You can read Hans Anderlecht's book now in English called In Resonance with Nature. Um, and there, he actually, in In Resonance with Nature, he gives you a number of exercises that you can do. So you can actually try it out for yourself. Mm. Um, of course, the, the best way to, to, to or, yeah, the best way to do it is to, um, is to, is to have your organization work with energetically. Um, and that's, that's when you really experience how that works and the synchronicity of it. The other thing we often we do is we're, we run um, kind of introductory workshops where you get to feel you can you can actually feel that energy. You know, you can feel the energy of the system. It's very simple. It's very it's amazing how simple it is. You know, you can actually, in one hand, kind of feel the energy of your organisation, for example, what it feels like now. And say you're thinking of a merger, you just put the other organisation in the other hand, and you start to bring them together. Your body responds in a certain way. It either relaxes and cheers up, yeah. or it contracts, and that's information. Yeah. You know? 
and you so, could save an awful lot of money. I mean, uh, it would have been interesting to do that regarding the euro, wouldn't it? Shall we do this? <laughs> Shall we have Greece in <laughs> or not? Um, like, it's just information from another perspective. You still, mm -hmm. you still want to do your economics on it. You still want to, you know, do all your other due diligence. Um, but this is another source of information that you know that you can include on your dashboard, and um, that, as you say, is is is, is basically free and <laughs> effortless. Just requires a little bit of openness. So that's also, as I kind of start to discover all of this, part of what I think is emerging in terms of the new civilization. Yes, that's far more effortless. Yeah, far more intuitive, where the knowing can be instant and decisions can be taken very quickly, based on you know a knowing that you already have. Because once you're working at that in that dimension, you it's kind of like space and time collapse. So you can check stuff in the future, you can check stuff in the past, you can, you know, check it anywhere on the planet. It doesn't matter. If um, I'm sorry to say, uh, I preface what I say by if it's true, because to me, I I honestly don't know. So, uh, but but if that is true, um, then for me, an obvious way to really really ramp that up would be to integrate it with capitalism. Because if we see money as energy flowing, as a kind of a store of, or representation of human energy flowing into human potential, then those people who are stewards of capital, whether it be banks or venture capitalists, um, if you could do the work that you're doing on their investments, then, for sort of a hedge fund or for a pension fund or whatever, even just a few percentage points makes a radical difference to the profit. You could actually relatively quickly have a massive impact and make a load of money. Yeah. That, has, think, has anyone tried that? I think in theory you could, um, but it's like psychics trying to predict the uh, you know the lottery or something. Um, the thing is, I mean, any time we have a project to balance, we test first from are we, is it okay to balance this? So you kind of check, is this all right to balance? And um, my hunch is that uh, you would only get a yes if it's something which is likely to add to the general vitality of the whole. So if it was like, unless there was a very good reason from it, balancing a project to develop the latest nasty weapon that's going to be used to, I don't know, destroy whatever, then you'd probably get a no, unless like life had a very weird plan <laughs> in in store. Yeah. I mean, have had like um, they, I remember they they were presented with a kind of um, intense uh, um, cow, you call it industrial kind of um, cow farm, you know, really horrible situation, and they were really surprised when the system said yes, go ahead and balance it, mm. and uh, you know, halfway through. The farmer got the idea that he actually wanted to turn it into an organic farm and everything else. So somewhere in the field was the possibility that this was going to become a life-affirming system. Um, so you could work with it in the financial sector. Um, particularly, it would be interesting particularly to look at it in the ethical finance system. Mm. Um, and who knows, maybe it would say, yes, go with this hedge fund. and then in Because one of the things we have to be humble about is we just can't, know what's in store or what the potential is that's in the field. So if you know if the system says yes and you get a yes, then in a way you've got to trust that life has a plan that's going to be for the good of the whole in this thing. And who knows what would happen to that hedge fund over time. But you see the most amazing synchronicities of developments happen in these projects when you're working with them that you just couldn't have predicted uh, from beforehand. Yeah. Can we step aside to science? Um, because uh, personally, I'm a total believer in science. I think science is fantastic, and uh, it um, has brought us from dark and primitive places and transformed our world, and, and I believe will continue to do so. But of course, the way in which we do science has been... Um, some people just bash science and say, oh, it's all bad, or it's all male-dominating patriarchy and that sort of thing. But... I think the way in which we've done it is kind of limiting and especially when science goes into areas like human behavior, human consciousness, complex complexity, life and so on. Um, the sort of the reductionist predictive falsifiable way of doing it is not so effective. Could you say a bit about your explorations with the Wisdom University and in, in seeing how to integrate 
wisdom and complexity into science? Yeah, I mean, I think for me the best example of the role of science, the positive side and the shadow side is, is the work at Princeton. So when Princeton University, their engineering department, decided to uh, inquire into whether human intention could affect uh, random generation of numbers, of ones and zeros on a computer. Um, because they were, I think the original impulse was they were concerned that pilots, when they changed their inner state, it was going to affect the very subtle instruments in the cockpits and things that they, some of the they were beginning to pick up. So that was the original impulse, I think. Um, and so for 28 years, they were doing this research. And any t every time they published a paper on it, the scientific community would say, yeah, but you haven't taken account this. So in the next experiment, they take that into account. And then again, they come back with another uh, but, ah, but you haven't included this, and so it went on for 28 years, of millions of these different experiments. By the time they got to the end, 28 years later, the statistical chance of what they had discovered being a luck was one in a billion. Okay, but, you know, that's the scientific, like one in a billion is chance that everything they showed how human intention affects the otherwise random nature of events, is the chance of that being fluke is one in a billion. And then in the video, uh, Bob Yarn and Brenda Dunn, who were the primary researchers at Princeton, they pulled together a lovely kind of compilation of the results, including a video. They quote a scientist saying to them, even if what you were saying is true, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. There's something about... Yes. Um, Which is faith faith rather than science. So we can, yeah. you know, we can enhance Anderweck with the work I was describing, energetic work earlier. And they did loads of research in the beginning, published loads of papers, tried to convince people that it was true. And but you can try to prove it as much as you want. But if the if the concept doesn't resonate with the paradigm of the person, then they're just not going to be able to see it. However much evidence you put in front of them, if they can't kind of grok it, if they can't get a sense of it, then it's they're still not going to believe it, even if it's been proved one in a billion statistically that it's true. Yeah. You know, it's, there's a very interesting um, thing around. Around, I still believe it's very worthwhile um, continuing to evaluate the impact of your activities in as integral a way as possible, which includes a third-person analysis, but also includes a second-person intersubjective exploration and your own inner intuition about things to make yeah. up a more integral picture yeah. of it. Um, but in the energetic work, for example, we always do things in pairs or teams so that when you get information, you check it with others and you see whether you're getting the same picture or not. So that's, that's how science really, in its essence, should work. It's intersubjective where a number of people corroborate their data and say, yeah, I was getting the same figure or a couple of percent off or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I think it's important for us to take seriously our inquiry into the nature of reality, um, but not to get obsessed with trying to prove things to everybody, because if people aren't open for it, they're not going to believe it anyway, however much data we throw at them. What is the shadow part of our system? What is the dark, unconscious or semi-conscious part? And how do we bring that into consciousness in a, a heal it in order to liberate our full potential? Mm. Um, well, I mean, I think the what let's start with what Western civilization has given us is the um, the individualization process, or in a healthier sense, the individuation process. So that that um, step to um, releasing the creative uh, potential of the individual to find their way, discover the world. Um, find out that what their contribution is, add value, and be rewarded for that value. That that whole piece, which is which is key to growing beyond the kind of just uh, sense of ourselves as as kind of uh, embedded in everything else, uh, without the individuation piece. Um, my sense is that the shadow is that what happened when we start, when we individuated. Uh, um, is that rather than transcending and including the uh, sense of um, kind of the precognitive or instinctive feeling of belonging or of being part of the earth uh, and our and our and the human family, we were we for some reason weren't able to 
transcend and include that, but transcended and, and repressed it. So, uh, in, like Ken Wilber would say, we differentiated, but then went on to dissociate. And differentiation is very important in development. You have to, you know, push away from a, a previous phase to be able to create space to establish the new way of being. But then you need to wrap it in again because that's the pathway. You know, take the essence of the past with you because that's the foundation which you stand on. Um, and I think what happened, uh, and it is showing up particularly in what we might broadly call Western civilization, but let's say the, the world which has embraced industrial development, um, has has and has has pushed away that piece, and that's you know the that that consciousness which we've suppressed or pushed away from, to tr in the belief that that will give us greater freedom, um, includes both the relationship to the earth, the relationship to each other, a relationship to our body. You know they're all the same uh, fundamentally. And um, I was smiling when you were asking me the question because um, when you said, how are we going to reintegrate that? Well, I think, uh, you know, if we, if we can actually begin to see, remind ourselves that we are the, the earth trying to work this out, then we, in the broadest sense of as the earth is doing it for us right now, because what we're being confronted with is the result of that repression, mm. which is mm. the earth kind of going, well, guys, you know... <laughs> Is his like if you choose to ignore this context which you actually belong to and kind of poison your home as it were, then it's going to come back to you and it's coming back to us in these extreme weather conditions and and everything else. So we're being reminded by our by the mother as it were that um, that we depend on this place, you know, and that we better kind of remember who we are <laughs> basically. Or else, you know, we don't, there's no, no space for us if we're going to abuse the life system that actually gave birth to us and supported us. Um, so I think that essentially our, our, our job right now is to, to do whatever healing we need to do in ourselves and collectively uh, to remind ourselves of who we are as the earth. Like it's not we are saving the earth. No, we are the earth trying to rebalance itself. You know, and if we can adopt that perspective, and it's a very different one that um, it starts from a basic assumption of, of, re of relationship rather than, and, and reciprocity rather than uh, one of separation and us doing something to, to it. Uh, and that's, you know, if we, I was saying to these, I was working with this Institute of Social Bankers yesterday, and I was saying, assume the earth and the life process is on your side, you know, because it is, and that's who you are. <coughs> Mm. aligned with the impulse of life and doing things that are going to add vitality to the system as a whole, then, uh, then you will be greatly supported by everything around you, you know, because that's what the system's trying to achieve as well. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there is great pain, I think, there as well, which we're going to have to deal with. And certainly when I tune into it and do work with groups and, and people suddenly realize how disrespectful we've been, you know, to this place that has actually given birth to us and feeds us literally every day, mm. not even aware of the grass we're walking on or the tree as we walk past it or, you know, this whole system. You know, it's like, it's like we completely forgot that all the trials and tribulations that our physical mothers went through to give birth to us and have never said thank you, you know, it's like the same thing. And, uh, you know, when we realize that, then, um, yeah, there's some deep healing that needs to go on there. But yeah. I think that key precondition for us to actually stretch up into the more energetic dimensions uh, of reality and be able to work with that consciously. One of my favorite quotes is from Ken Wilber where he says, when the great mother is repressed, the great goddess is concealed. Well, that says me when the great mother is repressed, when our, when our relationship to the earth, when the earth is repressed in our awareness, then our access to the subtle energetic domains of interconnectedness are concealed. Right. So we're not going to get access to that until we've reintegrated our relationship to the deep feminine, you could say, to the, to the earth, to our bodies and everything else. And yet what I'm seeing is we need access to that energetic dimension to be able to match the complexity of the challenges we're facing. Is so that, that, what does that look like when that's up and running? Where, where's that working well? 
Hmm. Um, or who, who is a sort of uh, great role model for that? Well, some of the early work, you know, that that, um, that John Seed and Joanna Macy did, they called Deep Ecology, or that they now call the work that reconnects, I think had a key piece of that. It's often been translated a little bit too romantically in terms of a back to nature romanticism. Hmm. Um, but if you can hold it in a, in a transpersonal context and see that the reason you're going back to those to that level, to that point in our story, is to heal a split and release energy that's been held there, so that it can stream through the system again and give us the energy we need to take the leap. If you can hold it in that perspective, then it's extremely uh, important work. Um, so that whole, that whole realm of, uh, of deep ecology, I think, is a key piece of Arnie Ness's work around that. Um, and in terms of, you know, we started experiments in the CAG here. We, had a, we did a purple retreat, a purple red retreat, to look at what would it mean, how would purple be kind of spiral dynamics code for that interconnectedness and red being the code for the individuation phase. What would it look like if we were able to, from the masculine perspective, hold our sense of interrelatedness as we manifest our energy and power? And from the feminine perspective, if uh, the feminine was able to step into its power without fearing that it was going to lose its sense of connectedness. Mm. So the men and the women split apart to do their work for a bit and come back together. And it was extremely powerful, and that's where this kind of natural order insight came. Mm. And we, yeah, so, the, so I don't actually know institutionally to what it, how far that's being done. I mean, another place, piece of work that's contributing to that is Stanislav Grof's work mm. and the whole holotropic breath work, where that's going back to the kind of pre-conscious phases in our development, even the kind of around the birth moments and the, what happened in those moments and reintegrating traumas and stuff that happened at that time. Um, so that that energy is available for us as we move into the transpersonal. Mm. Some of the some of the pieces of work that I kind of found inspiring for to do that piece. Yeah. Peter, we um, the the things that you and I have been talking about would be you could imagine it being very popular in New York or San Francisco or you know in London, but obviously we do live in a globalizing world um, and. That wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily sound the same to a, a Chinese general or someone working in a factory in Brazil or someone living in a refugee camp in northern Kenya. Um, and, and the reality is that the, 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 the fantastic story is that the rest of the world is catching up. Technology, ideas, economics have spread around the world and the rest are, you know, um, doing their own thing. And with that comes power. And so we, we, we still have something of an imperial, even very liberal minded people still have an imperialist mindset as if we run the world and we're in charge, but we're not, and ever decreasingly so. What, um, if, if all of the emerging powers, the Chinese, the, the Brazilians, I mean, all the cliched names, but you know, the huge number of emer emerging countries, operate at a value system which ours were operating at 100 or 50 years ago, materialistic, nationalistic, uh, power-based, and so on. Um, that could, well, maybe we've got no choice. Maybe that's just the way it is. Um, and if that's true, what can we do to survive it? Uh, and B, is there anything that we can do to help them uh, may sound patronize. Well, basically, how can we have a happy outcome without it ending in a, you know, where you're sitting um, in the middle of Holland in the last 150 years, there have been foreign armies have been over that area three times in, in that period, causing a lot of death. And, and with modern weapons, there are big risks uh, in us having lots of wars. What can we do to have a happy outcome? I, I think one thing that's important to do is to distinguish between the underlying codes at these phases of development, such as, you know, you talk, what did you say, modernity, uh, traditionalism. Um, these, are, these are the underlying uh, energies of the developmental phases that people move through and that we've been through in the past. To distinguish those deep codes with the content 
that uh, people uh, create out of those codes by which I mean. So we, when we came into this kind of modernist phase, created an industrial age society with all the trappings that we kind of see around us. That core code doesn't necessarily mean that you have to create an industrial society in the way we have. Like the essential elements of that code are individual freedom, uh, innovation, progress, growth, uh, a kind of rational exploration of reality. Uh, and so those can still be honored, I believe, by using, uh, by working with technologies and forms that aren't as damaging and destructive to the planet as the ones we have been. You know, we were the early adopters in a way. Western civilization pioneered that consciousness and we're rapidly learning the lessons. So in a way, what we have to offer is our, our, our humble failings, you know, turn to the these places and go, well, when we were experimenting with this phase, you know, this is what we did well and this is where we screwed up. So, you know, in our, actually in our own survival interests, you know, don't do this <laughs> like we did it. And here are some of the leading edge technologies, etc., that, that, you know, that we've come up with that maybe are a healthy expression that enable you to, to move through that phase of development with, with forms and technologies that are more aligned with the life process and the stuff that we came up with in our kind of ignorance as pioneers of, the, of, that, of that consciousness. Um, so that, I think what we, that's in a way the position we have to take in it is um, we've tried this, here are our lessons learned, and you know, in my sense, we need to make as much of our sustainable technology available as easily as possible to, the, to places like China and India um, in, in, a, in, a, some, in a find an economic form that's healthy, but ultimately for our survival, we need those places to adopt these technologies. Uh, and let me look at China. China's the biggest producer of solar panels anyway in the world. So they, so they, they're not silly, you know. They, these people have seen how we've screwed up. And in fact, there's uh, the, the Chinese have set up something called the World Cultural Forum as a, as a parallel in the way to the World Economic Forum. To say we want to profile China's proud cultural context, and they've asked, for example, Irvin Laszlo, who's one of the leading system thinkers in the world, who really gets this stuff very deeply, to help design that forum next year based on the theme of sustainability. You know, so there, so we have stuff to offer, and they may well be ahead in a number of different sectors because right. they've been doing their homework as well and the Chinese know that they've seen it on their back doorstep. If they cut down forests, it makes the land less stable. They get floods, landslides, and the, the, you know, the, the place gets, starts to get devastated, which impacts their ability to grow economically and, and the whole thing. So I think we can, um, at some level, we can trust the life process at its you know, in its most global context, that we are learning, life is learning, or the earth is learning, you know, through us as well as we move forward, and uh, if we come up with, with solutions which are going to be beneficial and help you move through phases of development in a way that's more aligned with life, uh, then I think in a way it's our duty to make sure that those are, that are available. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think as you're speaking, that reminds me of some interesting We've seen quite a lot of evidence coming from India, uh, particularly, where precisely because they they realise that they cannot repeat what we've done. There isn't the money or the resources, and because the majority of the population is still very, very, very poor, um, that kind of austerity and and need for simple. Um, what would you say, kind of simple and cheap solutions is actually driving innovation, which I think is going to, I suspect we're going to find that our health systems, for example, which have become, you know, completely unwieldy, will actually be re reverse engineered from India because they will, and, and China, they'll be doing stuff effectively and cheaply, which as ours collapse and become unaffordable, will will take on, I think. Yeah, I believe so too. Right. For anyone that would like to get in touch with you, Peter, or look follow your work, what's mm. the best web address? Uh, probably the easiest place to go, which has links to other stuff as well as my blog, which is petermerry.org. And you know, yeah, please do get in touch with the stuff you want to follow up with. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation, Nicholas.